men. Last week, we continued along our Lenten sermon series of our spiritual journey as we looked at the gift that God offers us in the form of repentance. And so this morning, we'll continue along as we investigate what it means to communicate the gospel message. So first thing, true or false, we'll play a little bit of a quiz here. You all can think about this for yourselves. Agree or disagree with this statement? Young people are not coming to church anymore. True, false, true, false. Think about it, think about it. Well, it's sort of true. A recent study put out by Pew Research says that over 36% of younger Americans no longer identify with religion of any sort. And here's the larger truth. It's not just young people. Overall, church affiliation has dropped to an all-time low. The number of people who don't identify with a religion has risen from, from around 10% in the 1980s to around 25% today. And if we look at the numbers more closely, just because about 70% of Americans still identify as Christians, it doesn't mean that these people are part of any church community. Overall, about 25% of people in the state of Oregon self-identify as worshiping at a local church. That's about the fifth lowest percentage within our 50 states. If we ask someone why they don't attend church, we can hear a variety of responses. The top responses coming from a recent CNN poll said that, one, they practice their faith in other ways. We've heard this before. Two, that, well, they're not believers, so why come to church? Or three, that there's actually no real reason that's very important as to why they don't show up. We are living in what author and teacher Todd Bolsinger describes in the book Canoeing the Mountains as uncharted territory of today's current religious and spiritual landscape. Now, I'm not sure about you, but this, it bothers me a little bit. If I, if I actually examine how I'm actually feeling about these statistics and trends, part of me has this righteous indignation towards those who don't identify with the church. Why do I put my time and effort to get up every Sunday morning and head to church, attend weekly meetings, and give of my hard-earned money when there are others who are sleeping in or sitting at Starbucks on Sunday mornings? taking exotic vacations and driving their fancy cars around town. Why don't they want to know about Christ's love? All kidding aside, there is a bit of an older brother complex that we sometimes communicate about those who don't go to church, similar to the story of the prodigal that we read just earlier. And I'm no stranger to this situation. I've, I've lived it. Maybe I still live it, in fact. I've always been a bit envious of my younger brother. I remember back in elementary school when he tested for the Able Learners program while I was left to sit with the normal kids in class. He always seemed to have more fun than me in school, too. He had a natural charisma about him. While I was working from the age of 14 with my paper route or my busboy duties at a local family restaurant, he was often laughing with his friends and playing sports. I went off to college, which, again, I paid for by myself through scholarships and working as a student. While his college experience is more akin to the movie Animal House. 
Things got really bad one day when my mom received a call from the hospital. It seemed that my brother had too much fun one night and was peeled off the street by an ambulance. Lucky to be alive and lucky not to kill anyone else. He would have to go to jail and court for his reckless behavior and withdraw from college altogether. My mom and dad were luckily there to pick up those phone calls, pay for the jail and court costs, and drive him home from college. And how does someone like my brother get repaid for his recklessness? Well, my parents help him get through the rest of college back home. He somehow finds a way to turn his entire life around his natural intelligence and charisma, help him start a wonderful career working with global marketing campaigns of cool, dynamic companies like Red Bull and IMAX. And he now lives just a few steps away from the beach near Los Angeles with his loving family. Every once in a while, I get a picture sent from him of his most recent trip to Hawaii or Thailand or Europe. And here I am, so happy (laughs) for my little brother. Not at all jealous. The story of the prodigal is one that may be familiar to all of us this morning in one form or another. It is a story of a family comprising of a loving father and two sons. The younger son insults the father by requesting his inheritance before the father has even died, only to throw it all away on senseless spending, reckless behavior, and an an absorbent lifestyle. Very quickly, after a series of unfortunate events, he finds himself living in poverty only to go back to the same father and ask for assistance once again. The younger son repented. The father could have responded in judgment and condemnation towards the younger son. Instead, he threw open his arms, ran to him, and welcomed his son home. And the older brother, the hard-working older brother, glared with jealousy at the reaction of the father towards the wayward younger son. Not only was he seething at the fortune of his younger brother once again, getting a free pass in life, but he was outright hostile towards his father, who provided the perceived free pass to the younger. And the father lovingly explains his response of embracing the younger son once again in verse 32. We had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. There is a pastor and writer named Timothy Keller who wrote a book called The Prodigal God. Some of you may be familiar with it. In the book, he explains that the true definition of prodigal is recklessly spendthrift. The term then just as well could be used to describe the father in this story who held nothing back in celebrating his son's return. And this is how we can describe our God as well. We worship a God who holds nothing back in embracing those sisters and brothers who return. We worship a prodigal God. Keller goes on even further in his analysis of the son's For many of us, we focus on the three characters of the story, the father and the two sons. However, Keller suggests that there is another figure that is brought to light to the surface within this parable. It is Christ, our brother, who instead of sitting and waiting for the younger son to come home like that of the older brother in the story, instead goes out into the world and seeks out the younger brothers and sisters like you and me, meets us in our brokenness, and together we return home to the kingdom of the Father. Isn't that what this church thing is all about, after all? About seeking out the lost and wayward and loving them to health and wholeness once again? This is the gospel message. 
The good news this morning, friends, the gospel message is not about good behavior or knowledge of religion, but about experiencing and sharing God's prodigal love, the gospel, with others. If we as the church could imagine a better way to share the gospel message, what would that change how people understood the church today? If instead of judging, criticizing, and secretly seething like the older brothers and sisters that we tend to be as the church towards our wayward siblings, perhaps we should be contemplating a different response. What if instead of asking why these individuals and families don't come to church, we ask why we aren't reaching out to them like that of Christ? Instead of inviting people to worship in our building, why not share God's love by meeting them for coffee or at the park or on the sports field where they already are? There are no easy answers, no guarantees. Would my younger brother all of a sudden find religion again if I were to show up at his house unannounced one morning? I'm pretty sure that might actually have the opposite effect. <laughs> But even if he never walks into another church again, I do feel that it's essential for me as a Christian to serve as an agent for God's love and grace in this world and in his life. Now, spoiler alert, we're not perfect people. We are not perfect examples of God's love. We are not God. In fact, Maybe that's what we lead with when engaging with this new, uncharted territory of our contextual religious landscape today. We are imperfect, broken people, loving other imperfect, broken people, reminding each other of the perfect love found in Christ Jesus. As we journey to the cross, this season of Lent. Let's experience this love together. May all God's children say, Amen. <laughs>